This is my most recent project I've been working on uh, with Ali Mazia, who's now at Google, and my two advisors, Eitan Adar and Mike Caffarella. Uh, the title is Leveraging Noisy Lists for Social Feed Ranking, and it's going to appear this July at ICWSM. So social networks have become not only places where you go to connect with friends, but also information hubs. So for instance, uh, I, I log on to Twitter to find the latest news on data mining and data science about the latest algorithms, papers, and so forth. Um, a common mechanism found in almost all social networks, including Twitter, Google+, Facebook, et cetera, is this concept of a feed. So feeds are great because they don't require that a user have to formulate a query in order to get information. It just pushes content from all the users that you follow. But at the same time, um, users can become burdened with uh, an overload of information. Uh, and because they're not specifying a specific query, uh, it may be hard for them to sift through the content that they need at a particular time, or that find something that they're interested in at a particular time. Uh, so for instance, this is just four hours of, of uh, example Twitter feed, and all the content that, get, that gets pushed to you know, someone who follows about, on average, 100 people. So you can imagine if, you know, as the social network grows and it gets bigger, and you start to friend more people, how this problem can be really burdensome to the end user. So we've isolated two, two major uh, causes of information overload. The first problem that, that we isolate is the problem of context collapse. So this is the idea that we have an example user, Alice, Alice over here, and her friends, that Alice is normally putting her friends into specific contexts. So she might have follow friends who are scientists, photographers, and base or sports fans. And normally, um, they would be in those contexts. But the problem is that there's no, there's, there's no way to do that on the social network. So just in her plain feed, she just gets all of the content from all of these friends. And it, it's overwhelming, and it causes that lots of that content may be irrelevant to her specific information need at a given time. Um, the second problem, so the, we kind of see this as the information consumer side of the problem. Um, the second problem is channel collapse, which is kind of the converse of this. So the idea is that it, for any given friend that Alice follows, let's say, look, look at Sally here. Sally tweets about many different topics. She tweets about everything from science to math, or and cooking and football and all these other things. Um, so the problem here is that since Sally can't channel her information about science to Alice, um, Alice gets all of her tweets that, that Sally tweet, uh, tweets, rather than just the one she's interested in. Um, and so there's only one channel to disseminate information. This is kind of the, this is, this is the problem of channel collapse. So there's these two major problems. Uh, and social networks have, have, they're aware of these problems. So they've implemented mechanisms to help users. Uh, one, of the, one of the mechanisms that uh, they've implemented, and this is almost on, I think, every social network, and Google Plus is kind of the first one to make it an integral part of their network. Uh, and uh, it's this idea of lists. So users can uh, group their friends by context. So right here, Alice, for instance, can group her friends into science, photography, and sports, and sports categories. Um, the problem is, and also Google Plus uh, has adopted a technology to allow users to specify who they want to see their messages. So this is the idea of, of like targeted, um, uh, of targeting the content, of targeting the users that you want to see your messages. The problem is that these mechanisms, they require a significant human effort, so all users must group people, uh, their friends, and at the same time, widespread adoption. So unless all of your friends are, are targeting the right users, then you're still going to have the problem of channel collapse. So um, the solution that we present in, in this work uh, is to build a system that can help users organize feed by topic. And what we want to do is we want to automatically group friends into topical lists. So do that list creation automatically, and then show users content that is relevant to the topics of those lists. Um, and in addition, we want to require no uh, supervision from the user. Even, but if they future work is, well, I'll talk about that later. But we want to require none. So we, uh, we created the system Butterworth. Um, and so the first step of Butterworth is to generate lists automatically. Uh, the second step is to, after we generated these lists, to automatically label them with, um, with a, a proper semantic label. And then after we do that, then to train a ranking model for each list uh, in which so we can push the relevant content to the topic of that list to the top of the feed. 
So the first step I want to explain to you is the list generation. So the way we do list generation is we take a user's uh, social network, something called the, Al in this case, we're going to look at Alice's network. And uh, we're going to look at her ego network, which consists of all of her friends and the connection between them. Um, so how we want to do this is we want to, we want to partition this network into topically coherent groups. So ideally, we'd want to do exactly what I was showing in the previous three slides, is to take Alice's science friends, her baseball friends, and her photography friends into uh, separate groups. Um, so our approach is to be using a community detection algorithm to, part to make this partition. Uh, one of the problems, though, is that the underlying friendship network on any given social network has you know, people connecting to each other for a variety of reasons, not just by, for, for topical reasons. So, for instance, um, you know, I may be on Twitter mostly to get data science news, but I also you know, friend many people just because they're my friends in real life, they're family members, we're in the same location, the same, we're affiliated with the same organization, and so forth. Um, so the underlying network structure may not, be, it may not produce topical lists like we want. So, and as a result, it uh, may, create, may create spurious lists that are not topical. So what we want to do is we want to reweight the network in according uh, to kind of uh, to enable the community detection algorithm to create better, more topical lists. So how we do that is to we uh, borrow a um, similarity measure from Adamic and Adar 2003 um, based on shared terms and neighbors. So the idea is simply that we take all of the content that um, these users have produced in the past, and we um, extract out all the unigrams and rank them using TFIDF. Uh, and then, as a parameter, we cut off the, the, the top K words. And we'll, we'll show you how, in experiments, what parameter we chose. And we use this equation over here on the right. Uh, don't look at the specifics. Basically, the first uh, term in the equation tries to uh, look at how, how many neighbors that each, between each two users, how many neighbors they have in common. And the second term is how many words they have in common. And they look at the, looks at the TFIDF score. So how unique is this, is this commonality between them. And so after we have a weighting, then we can feed this weighted algorithm to me, into a community detection algorithm, uh, or this weighted network into the community detection algorithm. And uh, so actually one of the problems we need to solve first, though, is that this procedure may create networks that are way too dense. And actually, in the first iteration of our system, basically, there's edges between everyone. And the community detection algorithm just wants to spit out one giant list, which is not something we want. So we just prune edges with where the weight's too small. So here, we would prune all these very tiny edges. And then we would create a network that is weighted, but also more um, is going to create better lists. Uh, we used the walk trap community detection algorithm, which just uses random walks to find um, communities with high modularity. So after we um, partition the user's network, then we want to label each of the partitions. So I'm going to present you two algorithms that we, we came up with for this. Um, the first one is the best overlap method. So the idea is to basically crowdsource what other users have created, what other lists, users, uh, lists that users have created on Twitter or any other social network. Um, we want to find uh, a a list that other users have made with the best, with the most overlap in, with the, in the users with the query list. Um, and we break ties by concatenating the list labels. So the idea here would be, is we look at Alice's science friends, oh sorry, the uh, sports fans, and let's say a user had created a list called baseball, and another user had created a list called sports, we're just going to take the list with the highest overlap to Alice's network here. Uh, the second method. And that we use this method in case there are no lists that have been created with the user, with the query users, um, which is definitely possible. Uh, so this other method extracts out bigram text from each of the user's profiles in the query list. Uh, so here, for instance, um, uh, this is a scientist, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, and so he specifies an astrophysicist and all these other aspects about him. Um, if we extract out the bigrams and rank it via TFIDF, we're going to find the bigrams that are most indicative of the list, of the list topic. Um, so after we have successfully labeled, uh, partitioned the network, and then uh, got, obtained labels, 
What we want to do is we want to rank the content from all the users coming from within a given list. So Alice can click on a list, and you know, let's say the list is about sports. We then want to push all the sports content to Alice, and then um, push all of the non-relevant uh, content to the bottom. So how do we do that? Uh, we want to train a topic ranker, just simply a naive Bayes model for each list. But the problem is that we don't have um, any ch labeled training data. And one of the requirements of the system was that we, we, we didn't want to have the user have to label or provide any supervision. So what we do is we propose some heuristics to obtain positive examples. And this falls under the category of distant or self-supervised learning in, in the machine learning literature. Um, uh, in order to obtain negative examples, we can just simply sample from outside of the users in the list. Um, so the first heuristic, which is the, something called the naive heuristic, and you'll see why, it's very simple. You just assume all of the, ex so you just take uh, tra an unlabeled training set, which would just be all the previous content coming from each user in a list, and you just assume all of it's labeled positive. Um, so this would, as you guess, introduce a lot of noise into the training data set. But since Naive Bayes is pretty robust to noise, it actually does quite well. And I'll show you in the experiments how that is. Um, the second heuristic is uh, a TF-IDF heuristic. So what we do is we take um, the unigrams, is we first extract out the unigrams and hashtags. And um, well, these are two different methods. So one is with hashtags, one with unigrams. And what we, what we do is we rank them via TF-IDF. And then we choose the top K hashtags slash or unigrams and label just those uh, tweets that have the um, one of the top K. So what this is, ideally would do would just pick out the truly positive examples in this list and um, leave out all the negative examples. And, as, uh, and then after we've obtained a labeled training data set, what we want to do is we... Um, take this labeled training data set and throw it into the naive Bayes classifier, or model in this case, not a classifier. And we want to produce a probability score for each item in the feed, and then rank by the probability score. And so ideally, you'd, have, you'd then push, be pushing the positive content to the top and, then, and the non-relevant content to the bottom. OK, so I've kind of given you an overview of, um, of the system. And now I want to describe for you the experiments that we ran to see how well it works. Uh, we tested on a data set from Twitter, because that was pu what was publicly available to us. Um, and we first ran experiments testing each one of the components of Butterworth, and then we also ran an end-to-end -end experiment testing the whole workflow. So uh, the first experiment, uh, set of experiments we ran, was to test the list generation. Um, What we wanted to do is we wanted to compare automatically generated lists to the um, organic lists created by a, a set of users on Twitter. So we gathered, we uh, came up with a way to find users that have created lots of lists on Twitter. Uh, and um, we wanted to then take this user's uh, uh, ego network and partition it and compare how well do our machine generated lists compared to the list that the user has, has already created. Um, and we evaluate uh, the success of our algorithm by producing an F1 score for each configuration of the list generation procedure. Uh, and so the, how, how we get this F1 score is in the following way. For every pair of users in um, the, uh, uh, the test user's um, ego network, we say that it's a true positive if, you and, if these two users appear together in both the machine-generated and organic lists. It's a false positive if it appears together in the machine-generated list but not in the organic list, and et cetera. And from that, we can produce an F1 score. Um, so this graph shows four, all the different configurations that we tried with, with the list generation procedure. So each graph represents um, a different uh, cut uh, cutoff for the key, the number of keywords that we took into account in the equation. So network only only takes into account the first term in the similarity equation, with just the network and doesn't look at content similarity between users. Uh, and all the other three graphs take into account k equals ten, all the way up to a thousand words. And each one of the bars in the bar chart represents the um, 
the threshold, how, uh, the threshold that we take for eliminating edges, spurious edges in the network. And so uh, the first um, bar is no cutoff, so we just don't eliminate any edges. And then we uh, have um, an epsilon, just a constant of one. And then we look at the mean, if we just take the mean edge weight and subtract the standard deviation, the mean edge weight and the mean edge weight plus the standard deviation. And what we see here is what we do best when we have k is equal to 10 and uh, mean uh, uh, a cutoff of mean minus standard deviation. And that gets us about 83% accurate. Or, sorry, 83 F1 score. OK, um, so I'm uh, skipping over the um, topic labeling results because I, I'm not going to have time. Um, but if you want to look at them, you, uh, you can get them in the paper. So uh, in order to evaluate the topic ranking results, we wanted, uh, we extracted, we obtained uh, 100 lists uh, from Twitter, publicly available lists, and sampled 100 tweets from each one of these lists. We then asked mechanical Turkers to rate each one of these as whether or not they are relevant to the topic of the list. And the topic was provided by the users who created the list. They can label the list. Um, and we have three judgments per list, and we do a majority rule vote. And so if we look at comparing the algorithms, we can see that the baseline technique, so if you just ranked the, uh, the, the feed uh, from all the users in a given list, just uh, chron reverse chronologically, we can see that the precision, oh, sorry, this precision recall plot with precision on the y-axis and recall on the x-axis. We can see that this baseline of just a ranking in reverse chronological order quickly approaches the relevancy rate of, um, which is about 60% for, on average, for a given list. And all of our uh, heuristics do much better, where the um, unigram with k is equal to 8, um, so we take the top 8 unigrams, does a little bit better than the other ones. Um, but they all, not significantly, so they all, they all do quite well. And, not uh, so pretty surprisingly, the naive method, which is really, really naive, does, does very well. So you get a little boost from, from doing something slightly more intelligent. Um, we also want to test how well uh, these precision replot, uh, how well the system uh, works under noise. So in this experiment, we just took various amounts of noise in the list. Uh, so we just replaced users in a given list, that organic list. So these were the test lists that we found off Twitter. We placed uh, users in a given list with some random users. So we want to see is how, how much noise can a list have um, such that these algorithms will still work. Because in our end-to-end -end experiment, we're going to have noisy, we're going to be generating the list, automatic list generation procedures can be quite noisy, or can be noisy. So we want to see how well, how well does ranking do despite having noise. And what we can see is that the naive algorithm is really robust to noise, so up to about 70%. It does pretty much just as well. And it's still not horrible at 90% noise. And the hashtag and uh, unigram uh, get progressively worse uh, when it comes to noise, because uh, the heuristic of finding the top uh, k unigrams or hashtags, is, it gets worse and worse as um, the amount of content is actually irrelevant to the topic of the list. So in our final experiment, we wanted to, uh, to test the end-to-end -end workflow. So we take a user's ego network. We partition it, create, automatically create lists. And then uh, we take 100 of these. We automatically create labels for them. And then we ask three experts to label the top 10 tweets as whether they're relevant or irrelevant for, for these lists. So this is a ma machine-generated label and machine-generated list. And then we're ranking the, and then asking whether the top 10 are relevant or irrelevant. So the results from this experiment are we have precision at k results. And so for precision at 10, the unigram, oh, we chose the unigram method because it was the best in our previous experiment. The unigram method gets a 78% uh, precision as opposed to the, to the reverse chronological order baseline of 45%. So it does, does much better. OK, uh, just to wrap it up, I presented to you our system Butterworth uh, as an end-to-end -end solution for organizing social feeds by topic without requiring uh, user supervision. In future work, we want to actually look at how we can build an interface that would allow for, for users to, to give us some supervision um, if they want to. Now we can incorporate that into providing a, making a better system. Uh, questions? Thank you very much.